Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. As you can well expect, Joseph Butler's sermon number nine, which is titled Upon Forgiveness of Injuries, is going to talk about some of those biblical precepts that have to do with forgiving those who wrong us and loving enemies. And he touches on this at several points, and he's got some important things to tell us. I think a good place to start is with a sort of equation that he is making. And this is uh, deep in the sermon. He says, as to that love of our enemies, which is commanded, commanded by who? By, by God. Um, this precept is no more than to forgive injuries, right? So the two of them for him are basically the same thing. He says, uh, what does this mean? Well, there's a general obligation to benevolence or goodwill to human beings that extends to you know, sort of a general obligation to people, you know, humanity at large, and then also to a lot of specific people in our lives. So if we suppose that, then we can equate these two because they're basically going to come down to that obligation. And one other one, which is connected to it, which is, as he says, to uh, keep clear of those abuses before mentioned. What are those abuses? The, the ones that are being discussed in Sermon 8 and here in Sermon 9, abuses of anger. Anger has legitimate purposes for Butler. God gave it to us, uh, not just as a defect, but for doing certain things. But it's pretty easy for us human beings to go astray with anger. So we have to be careful and forgiving our enemies or um, uh, loving our enemies is going to be part of that. And it doesn't just mean <laughs> loving enemies, loving human beings in general. So uh, backtracking a little bit to the beginning of the sermon, he says that um, what are these precepts to forgive and love enemies actually require of us? So first he tells us that the precepts to forgive and to love our enemies do not relate to that general indignation against injury and the authors of it. So general indignation, meaning like indignation that has to do with situations that don't directly concern us, but where we're like, yeah, that's screwed up. People shouldn't be doing that. They shouldn't be behaving that way in relation to others. And then he says it, it does pertain to this feeling or resentment when raised by private or personal injury. So people do things to us, to those that we care about, the people within our circles of concern. You could say those who we identify with or have some sort of obligation to. And then we, we get angry. And the question is, well, what do we actually do with the anger? Does forgiving our enemies require us not to be angry? And you know, Butler is going to say it doesn't actually forbid the feeling. We can be angry at people and provided we're not allowing that anger to, you know, grow too greatly or distort our views on things, we're actually not doing the wrong thing. What it does, he says, is forbid excess and abuse of that personal feeling, right? Uh, he says in cases of, of personal and private injury, um, 
And this is something that we actually do have to be quite careful about. Now, a little bit later on, he is going to talk about something that is um, often overlooked. We typically behave or assume, uh, you know, we, we treat these things in this way as if one feeling rules out another feeling. So if I'm angry at you, then I don't love you anymore. And Butler says, well, no, that's, that's not the case at all. Resentment or anger is compatible with what he calls goodwill or benevolence. He says, we often see both together in very high degrees, meaning developed to a considerable extent. What are the examples that he gives? I think this is very relatable for all of us, parents and children. You can love your kids, you can do right by them, you can exercise benevolence or goodwill towards them and be like, you are an a-hole, you're really getting on my last friggin' nerve. Can't you just stop your stupid behavior? Now, this could go both ways, right? This could be the children misbehaving and the parents love them, but they're also angry with them. It could also be screw up parents who are doing the wrong thing as well. And it's not just parents and children, as he's going to tell us. It extends to all sorts of other relationships as well. He talks about friendship and relationships of dependence. So, you know, perhaps something like uh, employee to employer, right? They can get angry with each other or a teacher to student. There's a kind of dependency relationship there. Um, client to patron. We could come up with all sorts of examples. And it, it, he says that it's actually very common where we both feel angry, resentful, and we also, you know, love the other person in the sense at least of displaying goodwill and benevolence. And he says, we may therefore love our enemy and yet have resentment against him for his injurious behavior towards us. The problem that arises, as he says, when this resentment entirely destroys our natural benevolence towards him, it is excessive and becomes malice or revenge. So the command to prevent its having this effect to forgive enemies is the same injuries is the same as to love our enemies because that love is always supposed unless destroyed by resentment. So we can feel resentful. Uh, that's okay. So long as we don't allow it, not just to lead to abuses, but to root out or we could even say just neutralize the natural benevolence, the natural willing good to the other person as a human being that we should feel. He's also got a very interesting example here about um, cases where we might actually have to do something to another person. He says, if lower in instances of injury may lessen our benevolence. So, you know, when people do things that are kind of minor to us, it makes us less benevolent towards them. Why may not higher or the highest destroy it? And he says, the answer is obvious. Now the answer isn't quite so obvious and he actually has to spell it out. And he makes three very interesting uh, distinctions here, or we could say a tripartite distinction. He says, it is not man's being a social creature, much less his being a moral agent from whence alone our obligations to goodwill towards him arise. There is an obligation to it prior to either of these arising from him being a sensible creature. So these are three different ways in which we can look at other human beings and ourselves. We can understand ourselves as a um, social creature that is, or sometimes it's translated as political. We are the kind of animal that exists in relationships and in society. We can also understand ourselves as moral beings, as capable of responsibility, free choice, weighing different options, prioritizing, screwing things up, getting things right, all of that. And that's quite important. But we can also look at human beings as what he's calling here sensible. And what does that mean? 
To be sensible is to be capable of happiness or misery. Or we could think of this as creatures that can be gratified or pleased and creatures that can be disappointed or suffer, that can be made miserable. So given that other human beings can be made miserable by us, we should refrain from doing that. That's part of what benevolence involves and we should actually try to improve their conditions. Now that's not to say that sociality or morality don't matter, but there's something yet more basic for Butler. So he goes on and he says, this obligation cannot be superseded by his moral character, right? What's, what does he mean there? Well, if they're a bad person, the kind of person that we get angry at because they do bad things, we still have a duty of benevolence to them. And then he says, okay, well, what about when we kill criminals? What about when we do public executions? And here, you know, like some people might say, well, you got to, they did something wrong. Therefore, you know, since they offended, we have to do something bad to them and write the scales. And that is not how Butler looks at it at all. He says instead that um, it, the, the guilt or the demerit of the criminal does not dispense with the obligation of good, the goodwill. Neither would this justify any severity what does justify executing them? Their life is inconsistent with the quiet and happiness of the world. And so another way of looking at this, he says, a general and more enlarged obligation necessarily destroys a particular and more confined one of the same kind, inconsistent with it. We normally would be benevolent, good willing towards the criminal, but because of the way in which they behave, we also have to think about everybody else who is affected in society by the bad actions of the criminal and therefore we um, execute them, we incapacitate them, we put them in prison, whatever it's going to be, right? So we don't do this lacking goodwill, but we have to suspend our goodwill towards that person so that we can exer exercise goodwill towards everybody else. Um, he goes on and he talks about um, this divine precept. He says, if all of this is true, what can a person say who will dispute the reasonableness or the possibility of obeying the divine precept we're now considering? Um, let him speak out and it must be like this that he will speak. A hu you know, human being is defective and faulty, the proper object of my goodwill whatever his faults are when they respect others, but not when they respect me, myself. And he says, no, you also need to think about yourself as, as being like other people in this respect. And so he says, thus love to our enemies and those who have been injurious to us is so far from being a rant. What does he mean by a rant? Well, this is a term that we use today, but back then they used it to mean like, crazy talk, right? Uh, the things that people would argue that are completely off base. So he says that it's actually a um, law of our nature to love enemies and what everyone must see and own who is not blinded by self-love. Our own self-love tends to make us more focused on thinking in terms of how we are affected, right? So somebody does something wrong to us. We see it as a bigger deal than it is. We, we get angry. We, we feel resentful. We, we don't want to be good willing towards them. And um, what, what do we have to do? So here's what, what, um, what Butler is going to say. It, what is the degree in which we're commanded to love our enemies or those who have been injurious to us? It would be well if it could be as easily reduced to practice. It cannot be imagined that we are required to love them with any sort of affection. So, you know, think about friends and family. We love them in a sense that goes beyond just being benevolent to them, being good to them, wishing good to them. We actually care about them. We actually feel affection towards them. We don't have to love enemies in that way. That's asking too much. He says, um, 
Suppose the person injured to have a due natural sense of the injury and no more, he ought to be affected towards the injurious person in the same way any good men uninterested in the case would be if they had the same just sense, which we suppose the injured person to have of the fault, after which there will yet remain real goodwill towards the offender. So what are we being commanded to do? We're not, we don't have to love in the sense of the affection of love, but we should have goodwill towards the person who is offending against us. And the way that we can do that is by getting away from our own particularity, our own focus on ourself and thinking about how other people would um, make sense of it. He says, now, what is there in all this which should be thought impracticable? I'm sure there's nothing in it unreasonable. It's indeed no more that we should not indulge a passion. The, what passion? The passion of anger. So it's okay for us to actually feel anger to, to a certain extent, not to the extent that it drives us into doing the wrong things. We can be angry with offenders and yet feel goodwill, benevolence towards them. And, you know, presumably if we catch ourselves losing that, we could say, well, how would other people see this? If they were, if it wasn't me and it was somebody else, how would I be looking at this situation? Could I still have benevolence towards that person? This is a cognitive remedy, you could say. And that would allow us to exhibit, at least in this understanding, love of enemies and forgiveness of injuries.